Um, my name is Hassan Logat, and uh, I I am a member of the People's Media Consortium, but I, I come from the Benchmarks Foundation, uh, which just explains how how is it that that I'm here. Benchmarks Foundation is one of many organizations that have come together to amplify the voices of, uh, if you like, labor, community groups, environmentalists, land activists, anti-mining activists, you know, and the names vary from, and I don't want to mention all EMG, Makua, Mawu, Mamua, in Mozambique, there's also Alternativa, there's Benchmarks, there's AIDC, there's a whole lot, Black Sash. Essentially, we're coming together to, to punch above our weight, you know, or rather to get our fair share, because we do not believe that the media actually listens to the issues that we raised, which are close to the constituencies of the poor and working people. But today is a doubly important day. We're trying to meet at a time to commemorate as a movement uh, uh, the press freedoms that we lost under the apartheid and are beginning to regain and fight to maintain under under this democratic dispensation. Now, uh, the, the roots of this particular day goes back to 19 October 1977, uh, when black consciousness leaders were, were, were arrested, uh, journalists in particular, and, uh, and their papers were banned you know, Percy Kobaza and people like that. So clearly it looks like a far away time, but on the background of that nasty and pernicious act, you know, people were charged under the Terrorism Act. It was a, it was really a closing down of the black consciousness as a tendency in the country. The black conscious movement played an incredible inspiration to students resisting uh, uh, apartheid at that time. So I think for today, uh, given our, our our discussion here today, we are asking, you know, uh, um, you know, is the media free for all, right? We are asking, basically, with the background that I've just sketched, right, whether uh, what was intended by us in the resistance post seventy seven, you know for a media that was really empowering to our organizations. I remember in the union movement, I, I I worked in publications for the workers. It was closely linked to workers' choirs and stuff like that. And every union had its own paper. And today, when we look back, there are no choirs, there are no newspapers. I wonder whether we have movement. But anyhow, I'm not going to answer this. I'm putting it to our challenge here to our, our panelists. Is the media free for all? Our first speaker will be Esli Flander, uh, who is a, a comrade working very hard on, on these subjects, but she's recently joined the TCOE, Trust for Rural Outreach and Education. And she will talk about their work in, in the light of what I've just said. Uh, of course, she'll be followed by Dale McKinley, and then by Uyanda, whom I will briefly introduce Esli about to speak. I'm also suggesting that maybe we start making introductory comments of about 10 minutes, and then we can have a discussion amongst ourselves for five more additional minutes, if you want, and then we open to all the comrades who are present. And yeah, Comrade Esley, uh, over to you. Thank you. Please put on your, your camera as you speak, and yeah. when you're not speaking, put it off. Can you see my, my camera's on? Yes. As I would do, I'll put mine off Great. so that I don't compete with you. Cool. All right. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and yes, TCOE is the Trust for Community Outreach and Education. Um, I have been with TCOE for the last, uh, just over a year now. Also, um, uh, and TCOE is also a member of the PMC, the People's Media Consortium. Now, the topic uh, that um, I'm just going to provide some brief insights to um, is where are the rural or where are the rural women, and this is in the context of media in in general. 
And I think the answer, I think that answer is not unknown. It's it's the rural women in particular are not well represented at all in the dominant media spaces. I think the reasons why have been debated and articulated very well. Um, and I thought I would start and open up the conversation with uh, a, an artwork that was commissioned by the Rural Women's Assembly. It's adapted from an illustration in the Fruits of Our Labour, an Ilrich publication, which was first adapted <clears throat> from an illustration by Sakpo. And as you can see, the rural women are very busy. It's a phrase, <laughs> and that's putting it mildly, it, the, the phrase when rural women are the backbone of agriculture is not said in vain. Um, rural women often, and, and by extension, rural communities as well, and rural movements do a lot of work, but it's mainly left invisible, ignored, and unacknowledged. I mean, there are snapshots here and there. There are opportunities that do present itself this one, this month in particular, being the International Day of Rural Women and World Food Day. There, there's some more coverage space that gets open. But if you're looking for consistent, in-depth quality coverage, that's where things start to struggle. And I thought that given that we are well aware of, more or less well aware of, and have had the conversations around um, the lack, this lack of coverage, I'd also then weave in um, some of the very inspiring um, media um, work that movements, the TCOE, rural movements, the TCOE have already established over a number of years that I've um, now con uh, contributed to as well. But these are media works um, and, and projects that have long been established um, and some of the successes and, and challenges around that as well. So. So I will just begin. I don't know if you can see. Okay, that's better. So I think for those that are not familiar with TCOE, as I mentioned, TCOE is a Trust for Community Outreach and Education. This year is actually its 40th anniversary, even though its history does extend further, um, further than 40 years. Um, also founded in the tradition of the Black Consciousness Movement and um, been going strong along with uh, the Nyanda National Land Movement, which is a rural movement um, where, uh, based in many, most of the provinces in the country, there's a membership footprint. Um, this is the membership consists of smallholder farmers, farm workers, landless peoples, and um, the priority campaign is around access to land and water. Um, and then as well, there's the Rural Women's Assembly. The Rural Women's Assembly has a presence in South Africa, as well as nine other SADC countries. This is a space for rural women, rural smallholder farmers, farm workers, landless women as well, fishers. Um, and we, the Rural Women's Assembly in particular, has a very vibrant um, media team that is led by the Southern Africa Media Coordinator, who is based in Zambia, Namasiko. Um, and as a great, as a as established a, a good tradition in disseminating information amongst its members, and from time to time also the media does there are spaces um, for the stories, but not enough, especially with the complex challenges facing rural women. And then the Kasau, that's the farm workers union that many would be familiar with, as well as Maubuye, and then two other projects that I think we will. Um, I mean, the one in particular in Yanda Community News that we will be, that this presentation will refer to, and a more recent um, sort of uh, smallholder farmers market, the Mowbray market that I'd like to mention that also started um, recently and has now become a monthly feature in Mowbray Cape Town, the first Saturday of every month. This is just a quick snapshot of the movements that we work with, but TCOE as a whole, its program focuses on rural movement building, food sovereignty, as well as rural democracy. We have an astute research team um, that works in partnership with the movements and um, we, the TCOE does both advocacy and building alternatives in practice, very importantly. Now, Inyan Community News was established in 1998, and uh, this was in response to the fact that 
print media, especially content in local languages, is insufficient. It doesn't service the needs of rural communities. So this is in response to this. In the other community, news is informed by stories from rural movements associated with the Inyanda National Land Movement. So its first port of call is information dissemination to the Inyanda National Land Movement members. It's in print, as I mentioned, and it is translated into uh, the, the languages in which um, we have uh, we have a presence in which sorry which the movements which form part of Inyanda National Land Movement has a presence, um, and through the practice of now very recently forming part of Inyanda Community News, you get an insight into the challenges of I mean besides many other things we could why stories why rural stories and rural women don't get traction in the media or print media space particularly um you you get a sense as the cost of living crisis increases as uh austerity measures continues um inflation runaway inflation it becomes a very costly exercise to be for for journalists in the dominant media space to get out to stories um what in Yanda Community News, the the the, the editorial approach that in Nanda Community News uses is to work with re, um, representatives from the local association who form part of the movement to submit stories that are pertinent to the leadership. Um, and then we also translate and yeah, um, a lot of what we do and how we work is based on what resources we have at the time. Um, at certain moments, this is a project that has been funded by the MDDA. Um, and then we are able to supply comrades with uh, tablets and also some resources for airtime and travel. But um, this is also that that funding space is growing quite um, limited. The other objective besides information dissemination is actually political education. Many of the movements engage in study circles and therefore this print um, printed uh, monthly newspaper um, serves as a, a political education tool. Um, uh, in the picture as well, you see an agroecology special supplement. If you had the paper, you'd open it and see that that's translated. That is also the work. I mean, this is another example of how we also match researchers. I think I saw Paula logged in. Paula does an amazing amount of work behind the scenes to also contribute to building up the content that um, that gets uh, sh uh, that gets shared in the paper. I also see Rulani, who's from the Mopani Farmers Association, in the room. Rulani has done very um, has done amazing stories from um, the Mopani Farmers Association. And one story we actually now currently working on, which is about the, a young co-op, for example, who are facing access to water challenges. Um, and although so, and that's that's the sort of approach we take. We work with what we have and who we and who is able to contribute and in that way also democratize the editorial process as much as we can. The challenges uh, are of course uh, besides um, the resources is the digital divide. The, the load shedding has a very bad impact on our ability to meet remotely because most of the time we rely on remote connections to meet, to discuss stories, to share information. So that there are challenges on all fronts, but um, they have been, um, there are also moments that we can celebrate, which is for example, um, around uh, a story that, um, Amuketsi from the Botsabella Unemployed Movement did around um, access to water. And here is an example of also um, uh, of working together with um, also being able to then feed that in from the story and feed the information into, or be able to share this besides in, in Inyanda News, be able to then share this on a platform like Workers World, uh, Workers World Media and um, local community stations. So the idea is that we don't just do stories for the Inyanda News, but see then how at other platforms we can be able to either share that information or talk about the story and so on. Um, the 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 st stories that we we do do, like I mentioned, it's the struggles, it's the victories, and in the dominant media space, there's it's it's usually very limited 
to um, the content itself is very limited as well. Um, so we try as far as possible to open up the editorial space. We work through WhatsApp group. We talk about things, but like I, I do mention, it can be challenging. And um, I can imagine in the dark, I haven't worked in print media myself. I have a community TV and public broadcasting uh, background, but even then the costs of going out to stories is expensive. But building networks like the PMC and working with other progressive spaces, it really does um, mean a lot and does help to um, create more traction around uh, a particular story. Yeah, so in the dominant media space, we do, there are moments where we do get some coverage, uh, the movements, the work the movements does. And I must say that while the sort of media bosses are clamping down budgets and really and, and limiting journalists' abilities to go out to tell stories, which is needed. I mean, the reality of the newsroom is that um, as costs increase, desktop publishing, uh, desktop reporting, um, you know, doing stories over WhatsApp. Uh, you to get your stories in, it's more and more work is required. You have to give the information to the journalists, and I mean, you do that in your interests. Um, but um, what I have noticed is a lot more journalists who would love to do more stories, would love to get outside of the urban spaces. Um, there's a lot of there is still a lot of goodwill, but it's important to understand the constraints that journalists face um, and the amount of stories that they're expected to cover with limited resources and time to research. There's a lot of, to critique. There's a lot dominant, you know, the media, sorry, the journalists from the dominant media spaces can do better. But I have great empathy for um, the spaces journalists are in in, the, in these newsrooms because uh, what, what they are meant to deliver and the tools that they are given to deliver don't match. Um, but um, as I, this is just a, a new, new frame once would at the time, uh, while well, it was around, we had some coverage there, um, ENSA, ETV. I mean, there are examples where, but like, I, like I've described, it's sporadic. It's not enough to follow through on, on an issue. It's not enough to under, for, for people to understand what's really on. And I, I think, you know, we have to understand that um, uh, these dominant media spaces, uh, they are quite like politicians. They only react when you know something, something big has happened, something really disruptive. Even um, the build up to stories when when communities, when movements are busy trying to negotiate, trying to find, talk, approaching municipalities, doing the the legwork before an issue blows up. That's where there's very little coverage, and that is what's most unfortunate because it's very it's it's often not well reported enough why certain. Um, certain things happen the way they do just because there's very little contextual understanding and time for the journalists to actually get into those stories. Um, then just very before I finish, want to mention some of the media initiatives from the Rural Women's Assembly. The Rural Women's Assembly is led by a media coordinator, Namasiko, who is based in Zambia. Each member, RWA, RWA member, country has its own um, media coordinator. They meet on a regular basis, the media team, they have set up their social media, they have a monthly uh, newsletter um, that goes out. Um, they also make use of virtual dialogues is the picture you can see different, um, the uh, RUA members would get together on, for example, tomorrow is Friday and there'll be a a webinar around um, to commemorate World Food Day and International Rural Women's Day. Um, they would gather in groups where the connection is strong. Um, and these are sort of teaching sessions, um, sharpening advocacy strategies, uh, sharing information. I mean, this is just the the communications with Inra. And then the SABC Channel Africa has been giving Rua, the Rural Women's Assembly uh, consistent coverage. They, they often respond to Rua's um, media statements and, and request interviews. But I know that in a lot of the member countries, and in, but, but getting other stories around women's struggles of land, water, farming, I mean, the picture 
of, that the media communicates about who's farming, who's 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 working the land is still very male dominant. You know, it's, it's it's a very male, masculine image. But women are the backbone of agriculture, and that's completely, almost completely ignored. Uh, so this is where, and and in South Africa, it's bad. In many of the other um, Rua member countries, it's it's even worse sometimes, um, but radio still remains an important channel of communication. Um, uh, but when it comes to television broadcasts and print, that's, that's lagging even further behind. So that was just a snapshot of um, the different sort of and insights into um, work that, that is being done by movements that TCOE works with uh, in the of challenges or opportunities um, and, and, and victories. Uh, these are steady work as I, I, I'm not the initiator of this. I've come into the process quite late. These have been well established, but it's just to, to show that yes, there is very little room for um, uh, rural women in particular in the media space or little very little coverage but also there is amazing work that is that is being done by activists themselves um, and it's all about growing and how to strengthen so i'll leave it there for now thank you asley uh i think that some of the points you raise touch on also the the difficulty of getting our issues raised you know the issues of the rural poor uh, the pace and and tenor of how we engage. Rural people are not your snappy urban ones who can give a 20-second soundbite, which seems to be governing the likes of 702 and other opinion makers. But we can pick it up later. I'm actually pleased to ask Comrade Dale uh, uh, to speak on this area because he's going to talk about what who does the dominant media serve? You know, I mean, I don't want to uh, go into what Dale is going to talk about, but he worked on various uh, publications. Uh, he writes in many left journals. His book, Tell Our Story, Multiplying Voices in the News Media, is clearly appropriate for this, but also working for Ilrig, you know, uh, trying to cover stories of internationalism and struggles of workers and the poor in, in all parts of the world and internationally is not something that, that this media simply loves. So Dale, over to you, comrade. Thanks, thanks, Comrade Hassan, and I hope that everyone can hear me. I apologize, I'm in the airport, uh, waiting for a flight back to Johannesburg after Ilrig's political school, so if you hear some background noise, um, I apologize. Um, I want to um, tell, our, tell our story, and my co-author is actually in this meeting. Um, and I'm going to speak uh, briefly about uh, what we talked about in the book about uh, what we call the the dominant media culture and particularly its application in the South African context. So when it comes to the dominant media, we're not talking necessarily simply about ownership issues. We're talking about content issues and the idea and the thoughts that are dominant within that media landscape. And also, when we talk about media, we're not simply talking about television and radio and newspapers. We're talking about all mediums of the media across the board, and particularly, obviously, in the last two or three decades, that has included uh, the internet and, and uh, electronic media that has now come to almost dominate, or at least is becoming a majority in relation to a lot of the, the dominant media itself. So just firstly, a little bit of a, a framing and historical framing before I get into a little bit more of the content. Um, so when it comes to the construction and impact of this dominant framing and discourse of, of the contemporary period in South Africa, we need to just reference the historical context within which it was born, nurtured, and then became naturalized in many ways as part of this post-apartheid political economy. Um, that is that what we accept as the, as, as legitimate um, and what we accept as sort of the way things are um, in the context of the, our thinking is fundamentally important to understand the nature of this dominant media. Um, so in this case, uh, what has reinforced these, this, this dominant media, what is uh, in, in the context of, of post-1990 for South Africa, 
is that as we made this um, there was an embracing of a capitalist neoliberalism. And not neoliberalism is fundamentally, as I don't have to necessarily make the argument, but it's hierarchical, uh, is, is, is oppressive, is exploitative, um, and it fundamentally privileges the role of private capital and the role of the dominant and elite voices in society. So that's the starting point of understanding that the dominant media is the dominant political and economic frame within which it has grown and been nurtured. And in the context of the last 30 years, um, what has happened is this has been wholeheartedly embraced, not just by the ANC as our ruling party and government, but also by capital and by a large portion of the population itself. So what we've come to under, I think what's become to be accepted fundamentally is this notion that the free market, the capitalist system, individualism, consumerism, uh, the powerful are the ones that control society. They're the ones that we must listen to. Their ideas are the best ideas. Um, and the poor and the working class and the majority are must be, uh, uh, adjust their, their world views and their experiences. And also that their own life experiences, their own stories, the ones that uh, were just as uh, was just talking about from the grassroots side are not heard and are certainly not profiled and are not, do not become part of this dominant media except for when it serves particular political or other particular propaganda purposes reality around neoliberalism not just in terms of social and economic realities that we experience and know about every day but inequality in terms of race inequality in terms of impact of who gets heard and what we hear and as we know the more as 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 joseph Goebbels, the nazi propagandist said um that you know the more you tell a lie the more people become to believe it. Um, and that's an extreme example, but the, the, the point is, is that we, would, we get bombarded constantly with particular kinds of discourses, particular kinds of ideas that are in the dominant media all the time. And this is what people then become to accept as that reality for a large extent. There are minorities, obviously, that contest it. There are grassroots organizations that try to do this, but they are oftentimes marginalized and pushed to the pushed to the side in terms of the scope of, of the um, voice. And so, you know, when the SABC covers something, uh, for example, in our country, SABC Radio and List of Ukosi FM, which is one of the largest listenerships in the country, you get an audience automatically of, you know, several million people potentially whereas a small paper coming out of a community or a lot of the npos that are organized we're, we're, we're lucky if we reach a few thousand people with that kind of messaging so the impact and the scope of, of the dominant media reproduces itself constantly in terms of naturalization of that discourse um and those ideas themselves um so what this then results in and it's no surprise obviously is that the dominant media reflects the views and interest of those who possess dominant political, economic, social, and cultural power, as well as position, i.e., those who occupy the CEOs, those who occupy government uh, bureaucracies, and so forth. Things that are told and what is covered in those in the dominant media tells and replicates and reinforces those discourses and those thoughts of the with power, those with economic, political, social, and cultural power. So there is a constantly linked and mutually reinforcing construction of this dominant media that we see. What we saw in the 1970s and 80s with a lot of the grassroots organizations and community media was a real contestation of that dominant media. But it was much, I wouldn't say easier, but it was certainly much clearer for people to see, well, here's the apartheid media, here's the racist media, here's the media that is pushing a particular line, and here's the movement media that anti apartheid. But once we had democracy, and once that was taken away, the lines were blurred. It was like, well, why do you need a community media? Why do you need an independent voice? Why do you need these other things? Now the SABC is within the hands of the democratic government, um, where we'll you know, cover these things one and two and so forth. And, and as a result, what we've seen over the last 25 years, as Hassan mentioned, is a massive decline in the in the presence of alternative media of all sorts, although there has been a, a degree of comeback in the last few years on the electronic front and the digital front that we're beginning to see 
And I'm not going to speak directly to that, but I think that that is a potential silver lining uh, in terms of the technology that can be used and how that has opened and democratized spaces that otherwise in previous years would not have necessarily been available. Um, I don't have the time to go through practical examples of this, but I wanted to just use one example, which is the Maracana massacre, just to, to sh give content to what I'm, I'm talking about in more sort of conceptual terms. So the, the massacre, which everybody knows, took place in, in August 2012, um, and it's, it's Jane Duncan who's done quite a lot of work on this, and we, in, in the book, Julie and I, um, and basically what she was arguing, and I'm quoting her, so saying that the coverage in the periods leading up to and including the massacre, quote, was heavily biased towards official accounts and overwhelmingly favored business sources, i.e. those who were most likely to be primary definers of the news stories. In other words, that's the, and, and if you, if those of us who are around and watch the massacre unfold, you know, we the voices of the black rulers are the voices of the community. We are those uh, uh, people, and they were completely almost obscured. And what we heard was government, we heard private capital, we heard um, uh, from the police, we heard from official sources for the most part. And as a result of that, for a large portion of the population, um, the story got defined in those particular terms with those particular kinds of views. Um, and that Americana. Uh, as, as Jane Duncan says, that Maricana Massacre, quote, provided a case study of how reporting can be, quote, system maintaining. In other words, constantly reinforcing this idea that in this case, workers were just being irresponsible, they were demanding way too many things, they were being violent, they needed to be dealt with, and yes, it's a tragedy that some of were killed, but that was an inevitability of the, of the story. And in a sense, that was the way that it was portrayed. Of course, we know that that is all false, but in the context of the way the dominant media told that story and the record, the impacts it had afterward. We see this. We've seen this now in the, what's happening in Palestine and what's happening in Gaza. We've seen it all across the world in many, many different contexts. So it's not a South African specific reality. And I want to just wrap up a, a few other uh, comments in, in relation to how this plays itself out um, in the more contemporary period. So the, the basically, um, Sorry, there's somebody who just needs to mute themselves. Erna, please mute yourself. When I mentioned going back and saying that dominant media reflects the views and interests of those who possess dominant political power, the oftentimes the critique of that is saying, well, those who possess power disagree amongst themselves. And marginalist are debates. That's what democracy is about. But the fundamental reality is, Julie and I have book and, 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 and research, is that there's a coalescing of ideological views and narratives amongst us about elites and talking about political and economic social precisely because, and go back to a fundamentally sort of classic uh, class analysis, is because they have fundamentally common class interests. Who are, for example, pro choice and others who are anti abortion. You might have some that disagree on LGBTI. In relation to the status of the poor and the working class and their voices and changing of the system and challenging. At least one can become a dominant voice. Of a narrative of the propaganda, as we all know, education in whatever form is fundamental to the way in which we see the world, the way in which we understand the world, the way in which we understand what we can do in that world. And it has oftentimes, I mean, there's been many things written about this over the years in terms of everything from Noam Chomsky's manufacturing consent and looking at the dominant media in the United States on an international level to looking at it all across the world in very specific ways. Local context. Fundamentally, this is the dominant media serves those interests. And this then raises the fundamental point, which is what many of us in, on this uh, uh, platform are involved in, is trying to contest that narrative, trying to construct a different narrative, trying to tell different stories of those that are at the bottom of those that are fighting the exploitation and corruption and the battle 
constantly, not only in terms of resources and capacity, but simply in getting the word out there and getting the, the medium itself, which is tightly controlled, and finding new and inventive ways to do that, which has become fundamentally a challenge. So in that sense, what the elites fear the most, and this is where we can see this potential silver lining in, a, in what might seem an otherwise a fairly uh, dark kind of situation where uh, we have lost a lot of that voice and a lot of that impact. What the elites fear the most is a loss of their class power, much anything in order to protect that, as we have seen uh, historically. And one of the crucial means of, of, of defending and strengthening that has been winning the battle of ideas. In other words, what goes on, as Steve Nico and since in the last 30 years, is that, and, and Gugu Atiango in terms of decolonizing our minds and freeing up the psychological and mental side of how we think of have our stories heard and to be able for other people to join us and so it is fundamental to the maintenance of that status quo, the maintenance of that oppression and that and 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 that uh, uh, dominance in, in the media. So in that context, what we begin to see, and I think what we are beginning to see shoots of in the digital space and other kinds of spaces which are not as easily controlled as, for example, the print media, or not as easily controlled as the airway. Are we beginning to see it's almost like the guerrilla media is coming back again in many different ways. Hitting here, hitting there, uh, taking, we can't take on the dominant media in many cases uh, because they're way too powerful and way too big in that context. But you can begin to take spaces and to begin to pick, pick away at that at, and, and to delegitimize that class power and that class status and begin to have people thinking. And social media, obviously, is another really serious way you can have very negative impacts, but it can have very positive uses at the same time. So that is fundamentally, I hope that that provides some kind of larger framing and picture of our understanding of who a dominant media says, but also because as we all know, as actors, we don't understand who our enemy is, we don't understand the real content, the way in which we try to engage that and the way in which we try to struggle is not going to be as effective unless we do that. So it's in that I offered the uh, input and I hope it's been helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Dale. Uh, I think that, you know, there are some points that I think we should pick up in the discussion. I mean, uh, the fact that public broadcasting sometimes becomes state broadcasting, and I think on a dovetail with our next speaker, at moments X like that, and if some good moments of, of good public debate and enhancing a national discourse, you know, there's an issue there that we need to talk about, about the value of public broadcasting or the commons that we need to recuperate. But there's also an issue that, um, I mean, it's worked so badly. Uh, for 14 years, we did Workers on Wednesday, which uh, the driving administrative and political arm of it was Workers on, uh, was uh, 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 the Workers World, right? Uh, Martin and, and his team. But we started when I was in the union movement and each of us, they supported the idea. It ran for 14 years quite well. And they just ditched it, saying that they'll get a new program and hopefully they were going to get some funding for it. There's a public broadcaster saying that. There was nothing wrong with the with the broadcasting. And they simply just ended it. They just ended it like that, you know. So the point that we we need to talk about is that how do we build the commons where the public broadcaster is really a friend of the people, it, an enabler of our other democratic rights rather than, than uh, uh, you know, narrowing it. But I, I also think then, that Dale, so that's the one issue that we can try and touch on a bit, but it brings me lovely into Uyanda uh, Siotula, whom we've worked with on Safe TV. She also has support public broadcasting, and we're so glad to have you. So please, my sister, the floor is yours. Enjoy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much um, for this opportunity. As mentioned, my name is Oyanda Siotula. Um, I am the national coordinator of the SOS Support Public Broadcasting Coalition. 
So we are basically an organization that supports public broadcasting, that advocates for it to be effective and uh, for it to actually you know, be able to fulfill its constitutional mandate. Um, and I am just trying to um, play my slideshow. All right. Um, yeah, and my my presentation today isn't you know going to focus only on public broadcasting, because I thought I should broaden it to bring other aspects um you know of you know some of the the the, the threats to media freedom because that's what I'm actually focusing on. But before I do that, I would like to just quickly you know highlight the importance of media freedom. Um, and why it is important for us to have this discussion today and why it is important for the media to be free. So we need to remember that, um, you know, media freedom is a fundamental pillar, uh, you know, in any democratic society. And obviously um, that we are speaking about media that is free, that is independent, that is sustainable, um, you know, that is able to then, you know, disseminate information to all um, citizens. Um, and we know that our constitution actually grants us, you know, that freedom of expression and that media freedom. But when we speak about implementation, you know, it becomes a different issue. And when we speak about, you know, the threats to media freedom, we need to be very aware that those threats inherently become a threat to the democracy that, you know, it has been, you know, fought for. Um, because then the media loses the power to be able to hold government accountable, to be able to, you know, really play that important role of allowing free and, you know, quality information to flow to different aspects of, you know, communities to drive that, um, you know, um, public debate. Um, and, and that's why we're having this discussion today. Um, and I, I think uh, zoom in on various threats um, you know, things that we've seen recently, um, and I think the biggest one is firstly the legislative amendments that we've seen recently that pose a huge threat um, to media freedom, and I'm also going to touch, you know, touch base on media technologies and how that, you know, also is a threat to, you know, media freedom as we know it. I'm going to look at sustainability, um, attacks on journalists. And the recent litigation that we've seen against um, journalists and media houses. Um, okay, and I'm just uh, I'm going for the sake of time because I know I've got a couple of slides. I'm just gonna try and power through this um, presentation. Uh, but if I'm moving too fast, please um, stop me at any time. Um, so there's about four um, legislations that are really critical to this, um, you know, discussion. And the first two. Um, you know, actually look at surveillance, right, and how government is actually trying to use, um, you know, um, you know, all this, uh, or, um, how government is actually trying to use state intelligence forces to connect mass surveillance, um, surveillance rather on, um, you know, citizens and that's interception of private communication. So um, the focus here is on the General Intelligence Laws Amendment Bill which is um, GLEB, as well as the regulation of interception of communication and provisions um, of communications related information act, which is RECA. And, and, and apart, I think with, with GLEB, apart from the fact that it actually, um, you know, uh, grants the, the vetting of NGOs and, um, you know, and, and, and community religious, and, I mean, religious institutions. What it actually also does is that it gives power to, um, you know, state agencies to, to vet um, and intercept communication. Um, but I think the biggest concern for us as the SOS coalition is the fact that it actually says, I'm just um, going to look here, it actually um, gives agencies these security agencies powers to vet individuals who have access to national key points. And we know that the SAPC is a national key point and the key people that would have access to the SAPC are obviously journalists and media practitioners. So which means that these individuals will be vetted. And obviously that's an infringement of you know, um, you know, um, a democracy, because then um, you've got all these journalists that are covering such important news and stories that are under surveillance. Um, right. And with, with Rika, what we also see is that there's going to be interception. It allows for interception of communication, which means that telephonic conversations 
um, you know, um, uh, emails, you know, um, are just going to be intercepted and monitored by government which also means that, you know, there's going to be exposure of confidential information. So sources of journalists that are covering very sensitive information, there's going to be, uh, you know, protection of whistleblowers is going to be compromised, right? And that is just going to open up um, intimidation of journalists and those sources and whistleblowers, which, you know, inherently this is um, an infringement of um, right to privacy. Um, and the two other legislations, right, um, the, the other one, they crimes and they hate which criminalizes uh, and, and it's crazy, and this restricts free speech, a cornerstone to democracy. And if you are found guilty, you know, you will be um, in prison for a minimum a maximum rather of eight years, um, right? And and if you actually look at all these, you know, um, uh, different legislation, the common denominator is that the power is being taken away from people and it's being, you know, given to government to control and and monitor, um, you know, um, people of South Africa, not only people of South Africa, but I mean, if you bring it to the media fraternity, then it's journalists, then it's, you know, the media um, and, and, and the production of news that, you know, um, going to be under surveillance. Um, and I think one other bill that is really, really close to the work that we do, that really speaks to, um, you know, is really at the core of what we do as the SOS Coalition is um, the new SADC bill that we have actually called for it to be withdrawn because we don't um, regard it as a bill because it doesn't do what it's actually supposed to do. It fails uh, to provide an adequate, um, you know, funding model for the SABC. But I think for the uh, for the purpose of this discussion, it's not going to be my focus. But I think the most alarming aspect, um, which relates to infringement of, you know, or, or um, to, to to government, um, you know, powers being unduly extended, is the fact that this bill grants the minister powers to extend functions of the SABC. It grants the minister powers to you know, appoint the SABC um, board, the commercial board, and to also have uh, the appointment of um, you know, the interim board of the SABC. Um, and, and it also grants the minister powers you know, over the remuneration of executive directors of the SABC, which, which is, you know, a problem um, because we know actually that obviously back during, um, back um, I think about six years ago under the Saudi era, and I mean, I, I always make reference to this because it's a great reminder of, you know, how catastrophic ministerial interference in the door that's wide open to political interference can be detrimental to the sustainability and the credibility of the public broadcaster. And I think it's very important to mention that here because then this is actually what this bill seeks to do, to really open those, those doors wide to political interference and which actually undermines the independence of the SABC, which, you know, was cemented by, you know, the, the, the Mato Jani judgment of 2017 that said, you know, the minister should not interfere with, you know, um, you know, with, with certain um, aspects of the SABC, which are within the jurisdiction of the SABC board. But now we see that, you know, these the, the, this particular legislation is being used to correct the errors that were pointed out to government, but it's used to actually legalize those very same flaws and errors, um, you know, that were pointed out in the past. And, and I think also the common denominator among these four legislations is that they are being rushed through to be passed, well, before the 2024 and uh, national elections that are coming up next year. And, and I think, um, they, like I said earlier, they give and grant these massive powers to government, um, you know, to control the media, which is a huge problem. And it's very difficult because it's civil society organizations, yes, we can do massive advocacy and campaigning and lobbying, but at the end of the day, our vote won't always be. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to ensure that, you know, some of these legislations and passed, um, you know, just so that the integrity um, is, you know, protected. 
Um, and I'm now just going to touch base on, um, you know, new media technologies and how, you know, the growth of the internet has also great. I mean, we appreciate it. It's great, but also it does pose as, um, you know, a threat to media freedom. Um, and I know this, this has been discussed, you know, um, much more than the aspects that we've discussed, because I know that it is media free of attending other engagements, and I know these always come up in these discussions. Um, I mean, the, the growth of, you know, new um, media platforms, new forms of communication, there's, you know, many sources and, and options and news sources are out there and difficult for a lame person, for somebody from the rural areas, for instance, to know and be able to decipher what is correct and true information and what is mis and disinformation, because also there's no there's no um you know media literacy and digital you know literacy to actually you know um teach people how to tell apart correct and accurate information from mis and disinformation because when an ordinary person gets a new story that's being sent on WhatsApp, you know, in a group, they quickly share it without fact checking. And that's how mis and disinformation actually spreads. Um, you know, so that that also then becomes a threat to media credibility because when people eventually see that this news is fake, they don't trace the source, but they, they then it becomes um, you know, a, 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 a matter of oh, well, this news is, is false, it's, it's not correct, it's not accurate. But then, um, you know, people then forget to go back and check the actual source. So what's this, you know, because that's why we've got these, you know, um, you know, credible, um, you know, media that subscribe to, to, to you know, codes that are within the industry, so, uh, you know, and bodies such as the press council, such as, you know, the BCCSA, so that, you know, they are held accountable. Uh, but you know, people in 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 our you know societies do not um, you know know that information. Um, and the other aspect of you know these new technologies and the internet is AI, you know, artificial intelligence, and how it's drastically changed changed um, you know the production of news. Uh, you know, we now have audiovisual content that's generated by AI platforms that, you know, it's very different, difficult to actually tell apart and know and, and know whether, you know, it's actually correct or, or, or not, because it's created in a way that it's very difficult to really tell it apart. And we then have these videos that are circulating that are, aren't really true, that are false. But if you don't know and if you don't fact check, you know, you, you're still going to be spreading information that is not correct. And all of these eventually, you know, build up this mistrust against, um, you know, um, uh, the dissemination of news, you know, on social media, particularly. Um, and, and, and it also becomes a huge threat to quality of journalism, right? Because how do you then, I mean, I know that a lot of other journalists, right, use AI as a source of you know, their stories. So they use AI and they, you know, do some research on AI and then they write a story based on that. And how do you then, you know, um, you know, factor in issues of, you know, fairness, um, you know, and, and ma making sure that the information is balanced and not biased and that it subscribes to, you know, the highest, um, you know, um, journalistic and ethical standards if it's generated by, you know, um, AI platforms. So those are some of um, the issues, you know, um, and also sustainability of the media is a major, major issue. Um, we know that, you know, the closure of, you know, um, media houses, obviously is something that's been happening, uh, but it also just worsened after COVID because a lot of, um, you know, media houses actually took a hit, um, you know, because during uh, the pandemic. And and this this financial struggle cuts across you know the three tiers of um, you know media which is public commercial and community media. So I've just added the examples of you know the recent challenges each of these tiers um, is currently facing. We know that independent media is planning to cut forty percent of its jobs, and you know community newspapers have recently complained about you know, how government is not supporting um, them through, um, you know, advertising, which obviously then assists with the sustainability. Uh, and also, you know, I know community um, media has been struggling with the issue of sustainability. But most recently, we've seen that the SABC has also lost one billion rand. Um, 
and and there's many factors and as, as SOS coalition we've you know really really been echoing these factors and saying you know these issues are going to eventually affect the public broadcaster but we've seen that it has lost so much money but how do we then expect the SABC to be able and not just the SABC but all, also these other um, you know media institutions how do we, how are they expected to be able to really cover huge uh, you know, base, um, community base when they're covering their stories. I mean, I, I, I know that Esli also mentioned, you know, that it's very expensive, you know, to travel and go and source out a story. And if there's no money, then that also impacts on the quality of journalism because then what really happens is, you know, really what she mentioned again earlier on, which is just desktop research, right? And there's no human factor, there's no, um, you know, field work that gets to be conducted to support um, those particular stories, which really, uh, you know, also just um, hampers the important investigative nature of journalism. Um, and, and eventually these, these um, sustainability issues lead to, you know, the public and the community media succumbing to commercial interests we know that the public broadcaster relies on, um, I mean, on, 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 on advertising for, I think, about 80% of their revenue, which is a problem because it's a public broadcaster. Majority of its money is supposed to come from, you know, uh, public funds, but that's not happening. But now that also, you know, really makes it vulnerable to, um, you know, commercial interest. But it's not just commercial interest. It's also political, you know, interference. Because if if a, if a if, if if the news media is you know weakened, you know it's very easy for political figures and political parties to really um, make a playground, um, and 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 eventually that translates to the credibility and the quality of news that uh, you know then the the ordinary person gets to receive. And, and now we're going to elections in the coming year, the SABC does not have money. And, you know, there's going to be voting stations right across the country. And the biggest question is how, how does it keep, um, how does it play its watchdog role in being, you know, um, available and accessible in all the different, you know, um, voting stations um, across the country? Um, all right, and I'm just, going to quickly speak to the recent attacks that we've seen, because I think, I mean, this is a long-standing issue. It's one of those issues that every year, whenever we're having conversations about media freedom, there's always going to be journalists that are being attacked, um, either by politicians, either by, um, you know, really powerful members of society. This year is no different. Um, and, and we've seen, you know, various intimidation and harassment of journalists. Um, and I think the, the issue about this one is that it does not create fear only in you know, the person that's experienced this intimidation, but it sends a very strong message also to other journalists you know, within um, the media sector because then it creates this atmosphere of fear, right? No one wants to, you know, the, it, then it, it, it's of spaces as you know, aren't accessible certain people not accessible right because of fear of intimidation and it also just stifles investigative journalism because then um you know journalists don't want to really dig deep into certain sensitive issues because they fear uh, being victimized uh, and that obviously eventually just narrows the range of perspectives that we need to see on certain you know stories and um you know uh, uh, news um news and information is circulating because you know various journalists unpacking and you know really uh, expressing their views um i mean we've seen rife um that I'm focus on the recently seen um you know offline um so um we might some of you might have seen this particular one the Daily Mail rec um, reporter Lirato Mutila was assaulted um, by Standard Bank security, um, dragged out of you know Standard Bank premises. Her phone was confiscated. Videos were deleted, and and this is a woman who's being manhandled by you know by men uh, and being dragged out. And obviously, this is a traumatic experience because she's a human being. Um, besides, you know, um, you know the the length of media uh, media freedom, but 
you know, from a personal point of view, as a woman, you're being manhandled and it's, it's an abuse and a threat to, you know, your existence. And the most, uh, the, the second recent one that we've seen is Lim Timkulu, an ENCA reporter who was pushed um, when she was reporting on a story on um, the grant payment and the delays, uh, you know, and the non-payments um, that we've recently seen where Sasa uh, beneficiaries were not able to get payment on time uh, because she then wanted to do that inside, um, you know, um, the post office premises. And all of these, you know, just make these, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, organizations that are really powerful. Uh, you know, a, a no go to area. And it, it takes somebody who's got courage to actually go back, you know, when there's another protest, um, you know, after having witnessed what happened to their colleagues. Um, and, you know, we've also seen litigations against journalists. Um, you know, we might remember the Billy Downer case and Karen Morn, um, where President Jacob Zuma, you know, took them to court and said the medical records. Um, that were published in the media shouldn't have been. Um, and, you know, I think the, the thing about this particular case is that eventually, um, you know, they won, they also send the strong, you know, all these powerful people that are trying to use our justice system as a pawn to really drive and abuse journalists. It actually sends a message to say that's, Execution will try to protect, um, you know, um, the, the 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 of journalism. And this another case that we've seen against um, House recently, Amapane, and in with this particular case, the Modi um group, again with this particular case. Because Amapungane eventually won, I think a couple of days ago, this also just sends a message to say, as much as we will have these court cases against the media, but there is still hope that, you know, with also the support of civil society organizations, because about these, um, you know, two cases is that there was support from civil society organizations, uh, such as Media Monitoring Africa, right? So this also just sends a strong message to say, our courts actually still recognize and value. Um, you know, um, media freedom. And as I conclude, I think it is important to note that there needs to be collaboration among civil society organization, interest groups, and, you know, the media to kind of ensure that media freedom and these legislations that have got an anti-democratic you know, uh, 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 mandate are being challenged in every aspect to ensure that, you know, um, eventually, um, you know, the, the, the media, media freedom prevails, right? And, you know, also the SABC, given that it is a public broadcaster and it is going to play a very, very important role in the upcoming elections, there's a need also for us as SOS Coalition to ensure that we really, really work very hard, you know, to ensure that it does actually play. Um, you know, it's 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 um you know it's 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 um democracy enhancing role, uh, which is actually supposed to play. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Uyanda. Uh, listen, just on the, uh, I mean, I want to open up for for the panelists to say some things between and amongst themselves. Uh, there's an issue here that. that uh, I mean, I interviewed yesterday about press freedom. I spent most of my time talking about the uh, slap suits and other things that that the group suffer. Also, in trying to an democracy, it's good that you covered us uh, are going through, uh, as, as a declining breed, the journalists. But uh, um, I think what one of the things that I think we really look is, and what is very frightening is the legislative changes. You know that uh, as we worked around on uh, say free TV, we need to, to have a public discussion at least amongst the various parties to see where the emphasis should be of this campaign. Uh, but I mean, we, shan't, we can't start it too late questions. The ruling party is quite killed. Uh, ensuring that the SD plays to its tune. 
they accused, I think it was Figele Mbalula, accused Patiswa, one of the new head of news then, now board member, for making them lose the last time. And I keep saying that, you know, no one makes you lose. Media is a reflection of what you do, unless it is orchestrated and pernicious as the campaign the BBC launched against Jeremy Corbyn. Anyhow, open to any of you comrades who want to say something to each other. Yeah, it's it's, it's there here. Um, I'll just keep my uh, video off. Where you want me to turn it on? Okay, I'll turn it on. Um, so yeah, two two different things that have been raised, and and thanks uh, to to the other presenters as well. Um, I think that there is. I just wanted to take on this, uh, and I'm not saying that this was what was being presented, but I think it's an underlying assumption that oftentimes we don't interrogate, which is this belief that simply because something is in uh, the citizen, or is in daily maverick, or is in something that it is true. And it comes across here, then it's false. I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you an example of how this has played itself out in the last few days in Copenhagen, Africa, against xenophobia, which I'm part of. So someone uh, put up a, on, on one of the WhatsApp groups, they put up a, a Operation Doula social media, this idea that some and Somalians were poisoning South Africans with fake goods and because of the two kids that died in Soweto um, in, in uh, eat, supposedly eating uh, biscuits that were um, uh, made them sick and, and pass away. Now, it was clearly a provocative, hateful, divisive, and untrue social post. And so then I responded, this, this is not, uh, you know, this hasn't been fact checked or anything. And they responded by then putting a link to an independent online article and said, but the independent online have it as well, so it has to be true. And, and, and I think, so there's this, and, and this is part of the, uh, I think, the, what I was talking about in terms of dominant media, is that because the dominant media, you know, has, you know, we have these sort of institutional frameworks, and because there's the sense that, you know, uh, they don't really lie and they're not engaged in fake news. They generally, most people generally tend to accept almost at face value what you find in these in these publications, uh, whether it's online. And I think that has to be problematized in, in the sense that was the first thing I wanted to just talk about. And the, the, the second thing is is this the issue of the essay in which you raise Hassan and, and comes across about comments and reclaiming the comments on the public broadcaster. And I think the, and, and having been part of the SLS coalition way back in the Right to Make campaign when we started it, and and, and a whole range of other kinds of, of struggles around the media, I think one of the mistakes that we made was that we, we didn't go beyond the critique of the state media, beyond issues of state control and manipulation. Um, we didn't think through, I don't think, what it meant to the public broadcast. What the institutions of public, public broadcaster management really look like? What would a public broadcaster editorial team really look like? What would uh, a public broadcaster journalism training look like? All of these other kinds of things. I know some people have done work on, but as a campaign, heads broadcasting public media, as opposed to, well, it's still state owned, it's still state this, but it's better because it doesn't serve the ANC. Uh, it serves everybody. But this this notion, I think, in South Africa, we're tied to the issue oftentimes of the state as opposed to the public, and we're tied to issues of nationalization as opposed to socialization. I think those issues uh, we need, uh, as, as movements across the board, we need to interrogate much more deeply and as well as come up with with more practical ways of how we can test that space so that we do have the possibility of convincing more and more people of the need for truly a commons media, a public media. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. I think that what you're opening up here now is, that, uh, is something that I think the other panelists must deal with. Media is also a business, and they're also not free of bias. The traditional media, if you want, where they are, why they are preferred by us is that they profess that they will do fact checking. They are accurate. Uh, uh, you know, they they do all those kind of things because clearly they have the resources, and that's the reason why they profess to have that. But the last few days, when Biden and others make comments on CNN, BBC being a broad public broadcaster, and others, 
where blatantly without any investigation and they simply want to spin the narrative. And this is the issue where I think that we need to look at the media as a as a whole because these practices come back to, to, to bite us here at home. So I guess, you know, over to any of you, Esli, uh, Rianda, any of you to just bite in if you want. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I just want to, uh, um, unfortunately, I'm actually struggling a bit here, you know, um, some of what Dave has, but I think it's it's a sound issue. Yeah, it's. Is the, the airway sorry, I think it is true. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. But, but you know, um, so I want, I want, if I can help a little bit, yes, they talk about we can't. Uh, you know, anti-African immigrants and blaming uh, uh, foreigners and stoking this thing, yeah, uh, the xenophobia. And, uh, and that's not responsible media. It's not even anti-racist media, given that we had World Conference Against Racism, yeah. And it was fighting racism, xenophobia, and other intolerances, you know. So clearly, just to take for granted, I mean, Daily Maverick, let me just help uh, add to it. I had to mention them yesterday by name in a, in a SABC interview to say that they are really high quality, but they seem to have a blind spot to critique US power and talk about Palestine, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, over to you. Uh, see what you. All right. Yes. Um. So I mean, yeah. That that that's that's really important. Um. I, I think that's really important because I mean, often what we see is because these are really massive and huge organizations. Some of them have been here, you know, for quite some time, and people just tend to take that information at first value. So I think also it is important for people to then compare that information, um, you know, with other credible or oh, well, supposedly credible um, media, because I, I think each and every person over time, the more you consume that media, the more you understand how it operates and the type of information and news stories that are there. And you tend over time to identify with that particular uh, you know, a, a, a news outlet. But I think what what also um, you know is a really a really um, you know a, a, a important issue is the fact that there's a trend um, that I mean, I've picked up recently that media likes doing, um, it'd be, be sensationalization of news, which is something that's been happening for quite some time, but now is making sure that if there's a story, you know, that trended, that was covered by ENCA, um, when the SABC covers that story, they tend to kind of adopt that very same narrative that made that particular story trend, and they don't question and unpack and, and then, you know, um, bring in various views uh, to that particular information. And I think we've seen this with, with the coverage of um, Mangosutu Butelezi's, um, you know, passing, where, you know, he was being glorified, he was being glorified eventually. And, you know, no one was questioning the issues of the past until, you know, eventually we started seeing the narrative changing. But I think that, I don't know if it's clear, Right, um, you know, amongst journalists to actually really, really, uh, you know, unpack these issues. Um, but I also think that you know, there's there's another tendency of allowing the media to be a platform for you know for the powerful to really drive the narrative. And I, I recently we saw how with the Joburg fire, how you know the minister just went, um, the minister and the presidency just went on and on about how the media is actually, um, you know, how, 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 you know, NGOs are perpetuating what is happening. And, you know, journalists went questioning and challenging those narratives. And I think now it, it, it also goes back to kind of journalism that is being taught in, in, you know, in our universities and, you know, the kind of journalism that is being practiced by the various, you know, journalists that we've got in South Africa. And I think there's a need for, for courage um, you know, and, and more training because, you know, obviously the times are changing, the media is changing, the platforms are changing. So there needs to be constant training of journalism so that it doesn't lose its value and that, you know, journalists are forever reminded of the important role to really question and unpack those issues and also just to dig deep into issues and not take whatever the person is saying at, at, at face, face value. Um, yeah, I think I'll end there for now. Is it? You muted, sister. Sorry about that. Yes, I can also do that. And I think 
What is also missing, especially probably in all mediums, but more so with broadcast journalism, is the idea of beats, where a journalist is given the time and the resources to develop a specialist area within their reporting and their you know, the journalism work. It happens, it's it's just the space for that is limiting because from my own public broadcast experience, I mean, you, I came from community TV into a public broadcast space, and then within a week or two, you thrown literally in the deep end, very little editorial support guidance. Um, I, I mean, we there's the assumption that, for example, uh, regular news meetings happen, and and be the, the what the infrastructure and support that's left is is quite dire for journalists so you you, you go into the space as um i mean many young journalists go into the space and then if, almost immediately they expected to report on issues that they have no background or um, experience in and then the deadline turnaround times is is unrealistic for quality work and then secondly, it's multiple. It's just the, the insane amount of pressure on the ability to produce stories and content. With less journalists, they expect it to do more. So then your quality suffers. There's no research. There's no, a lot of them, um, senior people are either gone, retrenched, left, kicked out of these spaces. Um, so many are left to either sink or swim. And um, that's a big one. I, I think there was a time where um, people had what they call beats. And then over a number of years, you will develop an expertise in that. Mm -hmm. Then research capacity and support and time to research, um, that's, that's, that's almost non-existent. Um, if you are familiar with what is often said in media statements and what gets reported, it sometimes is not just people. You'll see stories that are not even just quoting um, from media statements. They actually using this as the copy for their story. And as that is happening more and more, I mean, if, for example, you're on the right side, that might work, but it shouldn't be a common practice of, you know, from at all the, 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 the ability to um, ask critical questions is, if perhaps the key skill is for the media and and, and media workers. So, um, and and the the um, as has been pointed out before, the quality of training needs to be interrogated. Um, and and so, um, yeah, it's both with regards to the resources and infrastructure that's available for journalists, also the training. Um, and then if I could just generally say in this time of AI, digital spaces and so on, there never, there's never been a better time in a way to self-generate content. But the flip side of that is it's never been a harder time to um, differentiate fact fiction propaganda or all of the above. Um, and in many ways, we also have to look at our own digital literary skills, what is needed, what is coming. In many ways, it's not even just about what is needed right now. We need to be able to start looking at what trajectory are we really on with all these technologies and the way in which these uh, technologies, media technologies, the improvements are escalating at such a rapid rate that we now need to really look far, far ahead and understand what skills we need, all of us, both um, those that produce and those that make use of media, what skills are needed to be able to navigate what is becoming a messier and murkier uh, media landscape. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, I think that uh, what I, what I mean, I see there's a question coming up, but let me just say this, Dale raised the issue and you can read it at your own time, he had to take his leave because he's taking a flight, and that's his apology as well for the sound. Essentially, that the media here yeah, was producing fake news allegedly from an anti-xenophobia person, and you can you can have a look at that quote and then maybe come back to it as you see fit. But uh, Martin, over to you. Let me just state that we want to open up to the rest of the comrades for the next fifteen odd minutes or so, and let's see how we go. If need be, we can extend. Martin, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Arsene. Um Look, I mean, just from the 
people's media consortium perspective and why we were started, <clears throat> it's 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 influenced by the recognition that in terms of media freedom and public opinion, we are in serious trouble um, in terms of what's happening in the world and particularly media. So I think Dale was the one who highlighted, and I think he made reference to Chomsky, um, about media ownership and control. And those own, of course, the means of production, control the narrative. Now, on top of that, over the last 50 years especially, we've seen a massive consolidation of media ownership and control, mergers, uh, and monopolization of the media by a few major companies uh, all over the world, including South Africa. South Africa is also highly centralized, monopolized media. So that's on the kind of economic front and media as a sector. Uh, and of course, they dominate in terms of TV, newspapers, etc. On the other side, we're also noting from the ruling classes of the world, that there's a major shift to the right, okay? If we look at Europe, the politics of Europe, North America, especially imperialism generally, over the last 40 years, there's been a shift to the right and more acutely in the last 10 years, right? So what this means is that in terms of the media that they control, their narratives and perspectives, which are informed by the crisis that we are facing uh, in the capitalist system as a whole, and also the, the, the total. And so part of doing that is to dominate the narrative uh, with certain views, certain perspectives that support their position in society, right? Now, having said that, look, let's look at concrete examples where this is already happening. And none, none other than what's unfolding right now as we speak in the case of the genocide of the Palestinian, the native Palestinian people. And if you look at all the Western media, or well, the mainstream media, and if you look at even South African media, uh, what they've successfully done is to demonize the resistance to to colonial uh, oppression, Israeli uh, genocide, um, by demonizing the likes of Hamas and all resistance movement, even stretching back 30, 40 years to the PLO uh, as terrorists, right? Um, and worse, if we just look at the specifics recently, and this is not to deny what Hamas did in its attacks on civilians, etc. But it never ever goes into the history or the con the the context of what happened um, and Hamas's attack, what's happened in Gaza, especially for the last sixteen years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And worse than that, worse than that, what it claimed recently with with uh, Hamas-led attack uh, on southern Israel is that you know babies, several dozen babies were beheaded. Women were raped, and yet there was no evidence of that. Now, of course, what this does in the public mind, similar to what was done in the relation to Iraq in the 90s and early 2000s, you know, the lies about weapons of mass destruction, is that if you demonize, uh, you know, your opposition like that, your liberation movement, right, then, of course, they're monsters. As the Israeli uh, defense minister said, they are human animals. And of course, if they behave that way by beheading babies, then they deserve to be killed. So what's happened is that the mainstream media of the West, in the case of uh, Palestine and its liberation struggle, has demonized it to such an extent that they are prepared to justify, to rationalize the genocide of the Palestinian people. And of course, not only their complicity, but supporting it directly through arms, right? So the U.S., Western governments, Britain, France, etc., are directly involved in supporting the genocide of the Palestinians, including lying about the bombing of a hospital where over 500 people were killed and thousands injured, right? They are 
justifying that through the mainstream media. And so what I'm saying is that that poses a real danger to us in terms of public opinion and the people that we hope to influence to create change, to build movements, et cetera, et cetera. Another concrete example is, of course, India and the fastest uh, Hindu-inspired uh, party, uh, the BJP, and its uh, oppression, violent oppression of, of Muslims in the country. And you should see what the Indian mainstream media does. It's extreme. So, comrades, what I'm saying is that we have a real problem. And from the People's Media Consortium, there are twofold strategic uh, task. One is, to, of course, to challenge the mainstream media consistently, attacking them, demanding our own space, uh, including the SABC in our country. And secondly, and very importantly, is building our own mass media capacity to directly challenge, uh, you know, in terms of audience and, and getting our voices and views out there. Thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, I alluded to some of the, the roles of, of how public broadcasting has been compromised in Britain and elsewhere. Can we take some more callers, uh, some more participants uh, to give voices before I direct my panelists to look at some of the issues particularly raised about the challenges on the SABC before the elections? Anyone else? Comrades, uh, Martin spoke at, at some length about uh, uh, how the coverage uh, was held on, on, let's mention the public broadcasters of the world, okay, which have a greater responsibility because of public funds. Uh, they they basically get in, in line and do the hatchet job like the private media. There's no real difference in some ways. Now, but one of the things that, they, they lie as usual. But one of the things they don't cover is the rallies in support of, of Palestinian resistance and the cause of the Palestinians. If anything like that happened for Ukraine, there would have been massive, even if it's four people, there would have been TV coverage for it. So clearly something to be, to be raised about how public broadcasters are aping the private and that the private also have a, a public service commitment. I'm a, I'm a big complainer about when people do these things, uh, as, as Dale said, that they, they, they miss, uh, they, they reported fake news. I mean, I've taken IOL and they've offered to do apologies. So we need to really work on those kind of things. Complain using their own. I know IOL has moved out of the press uh, council. They've had an internal ombuds office, but we need to raise the complaints because this in itself is an educational tool. Sharon, my comrade, please over. Thanks, Hassan. I just wanted to... Um underscore the point that you raised about selective media coverage. And I think one of the panelists spoke about this sensationalism. Uh, you know, last week, Saturday, um, various working class organizations uh, organized a march to um, mark the death of 77 people who burned to death in, in a building at St. Albert Street in, in downtown Johannesburg, but to also hold the Johannesburg uh, city to account for failure on, on all levels around how it responded to that humanitarian disaster, the man-made humanitarian disaster. 3,000 people plus on the streets. And I think there was just one interview uh, that was post the march. There was absolutely no coverage. And yet you have a hundred people over branded with Operation Dadula material and they get huge time on, on, on uh, coverage and they get interviewed. And I think that this is a serious problem with making it as if all sides are equal and that a vigilante group like Operation Dadula can be sitting in a panel discussion and we're having an argument uh, as if, you know, it's, it's, it's all things equal and that they respect uh, the constitutional values and 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 laws in our country so i i think it it really the the points that have been raised around who owns the media and who frames the narrative and and i think that we as as movements on the ground are losing the battle in terms of 
coverage of of you know our work and what we are doing and our voices and and i do i mean i agree i think there's a lot of work to be done in building uh, the alternative media to cover these these the, the the work that we are doing and 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 challenging power thanks sharon uh, very valuable. I mean, I think it dovetails with Dale's earlier point about the fake news coverage, which purports to come from our movements, basically saying things against immigrants. But listen, comrades, uh, uh, let me let me make it a bit more difficult. Uh, sometimes we have the offerings, uh, the victories that we have won, but the offerings of the Constitution, I don't think sometimes we use them fully. So, for example, we have community radio stations. We can't deny it. But there's no excuse why the mafia groups and some cliques have taken them over, you know. I mean, clearly, it looks like they're so unrepresentative. If we had these public audiences where working class people were listening and some unions were backing some of it, we begin to rebuild some of the public service ethos in, in these other or, or progressive values, values of the commons. But, you know, I think sometimes we don't we don't do that. These things die under our watch. I know some groups have got a few, uh, 10, 15 such organizations under uh, working with them, but ultimately we've got to take some responsibility. And then the second point I wanted to raise was, I'm a habitual complainer when it comes to these guys. Even if I know I'm going to lose the case, I'll complain because I know at the end of the day I can come back to it. Esli, you wanted to say something, and then I want to go back to Yanda regarding what can we do to make sure that the SCBC is not captured before the elections. I just wanted to add, I think, to your reference also to community the media spaces. And one concerning trend is that, you know, what is the sort of mandate of community media versus public media versus private media? Since there is a trend that community media seeks to sort of emulate the private media, but just on a much smaller scale with a lot less resources. So it's often it's moving in the direction of more uh, talent promotion, like a stepping stone to to commercial media rather than embracing what actually community media means, not just also in context, in content, but also in process and production and, and just in practice in general, the spirit of, of community TV. I just wanted to highlight that as well. Martin, I think your voice is needed on this uh, because Workers' World, uh, I raised earlier about how Workers' World, uh, Workers' on Wednesday was cut and all that, but but. Uh, your work with community uh, radio, I mean, is there gravitas there? Because you know, if we had big publics out there, you know, it will it will filter through. If the likes of Noomsa and others were using it in some way, I see Noomsa wants to start their own Zoom or YouTube video channel. That's all fine, but you know, you can also use what is offering for poor people. But Martin, over to you. Look, um, yeah, we did try for a number of years through forums that we initiated in many communities, labor community media forums. And one of the agenda items was always about transforming the community radio stations. But um, look, unfortunately, I think many of the local activists and the members of the forum kind of lacked the confidence, the ability to take on the those who were controlling the community radio stations. They made inroads in certain areas. I know, in fact, they partnered very well with Alex FM. Um, but beyond that, not, not much. Um, and it's a reflection of the fact that in most communities, community organization movements are relatively weak. So there's no organization to really challenge those who took control of community radio stations and who handle them, as you said, they clicks. Uh, it's like small businesses. Um, so, and the other thing, as you into that, trade unions as well are not really interested in community media. They more, they love the mainstream. They love being, you know, accessed on the mainstream. Um, but they're not even prepared to criticize or fight to the mainstream or campaign. So um, that's the unfortunate reality, and we didn't get very far with our transformation of community radio stations at all. I think community TV is even worse. Cape Town TV is a kind of shining example of community TV. Uh, but the others are all dominated by business interest or 
church groups or whatever. Hmm. Uh, you know, Martin, just on the issue of communities of interest, I mean, uh, the Salam Media, for example, 786 uh, radio, those kind of uh, radio stations actually sometimes cover national news. Even when I was in Satu, first kind of station you'd have Khadija Davis from Cape Town, a Muslim station will be calling about national news. So there are pockets of these, I'm sure maybe with Bush, you can, but you know, really, I, I even ask for self-interest, you know, if there's one area that can just make sure that one of them work for a, a constituency that's affected. But listen, we're running quickly out of time. We, under, we you know how we quickly, and the mark is to get some credit for this, how quickly we put together Save Free TV. Uh, can we have a conversation amongst parties about how we can lodge this public conversation you know, to engage before a campaign about the changes that are required, that the SABC intends, that we believe will undermine uh, democracy and empower one faction of our society. Mm, 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 mm. I think that's a great point. Um, I think that's a great point because I think what's really needed um, is collaboration, is massive you know, holding hands of civil society organization and not just civil society organizations, uh, but also, you know, the public, because often we are in the forefront as civil society organizations, but, you know, the people that actually rely on the SABC don't even see the value in what we are fighting for. So I think, um, you know, there's a lot of work that actually needs to be done. And I think from 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 my perspective, the, the major the major issue, right, where really, really, you know, hands need to be joined is, you know, ensuring that the SAPC bill is not passed in that particular state. Because should it be passed in that state, then the SAPC eventually will become a state broadcaster and not a public broadcaster. And, you know, obviously that, that's a huge problem. Um, but I mean, I, I mean, just to also just broadly speak, you know, to some of the issues that, you know, had been spoken about, um, you know, earlier is 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 the fact that you know we go into elections, right? And the SAPC is a public broadcaster. There's a need to also, you know, in our in our collaborations to also bring communities together, empower communities, you know, drive civic education campaigns, and also equip people, you know, to be a, to be actually the ones that hold the SABC accountable. Because you know, people don't even know, you know, it gets to a point where you know there's an assumption that they don't care. They do care. Right, but they just don't even know the mechanisms and the right processes to be taken to hold the SAPC accountable. I think there's a lot of information that needs to be translated from civil society to organizations. Uh, I mean, to 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 the public and also just collaborations. I know you mentioned that we, you know, we quickly put together, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, um, safe free TV, and I think that can be done. And maybe that's exactly what we need to ensure that you know, the public broadcaster is, you know, salvaged um, just before elections. And, and also beyond that, um, we need to remember that some of the, the issues, you know, um, are based on what Martin has just spoken about, because I, I don't think that's something that's unique only to, you know, um, community media. But I mean, we see that as well with, you know, public broadcasting where there is, you know, reliance on, on commercial, um, you know, revenue generation, and that is the biggest, the biggest problem. Which is why, you know, we've got, you know, selective media coverage because those stories aren't going to make money for the public broadcaster. And I think, you know, these commercial interests are, are, are now really shifting, you know, that important role that, you know, um, you know, the public broadcaster is actually supposed to be fulfilling, and and wow. and. and uh, Rulani, please mute yourself. And I think. Mark, please uh, mute Rulani. And yeah, so so that's that. And and because the SABC is so weak, right? Because um of you know the loss of one billion rand. There's a lot of um now I've lost my my, my train of thoughts. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry, don't um, worry. You'll get it. Listen, uh, let me just say from 
I, I know we it's part of our standing mandate and this is our platform in the way people's media consortium will be there you guys have have in some way the SABC as your prime mandate it is also part of our mandate but not our prime one so what I'm suggesting that I would just suggest a bit of a consideration that maybe our working committees meet the two teams to work out what we both want out of this process but I would want to suggest that if it goes ahead uh, we should book a venue inside the SABC one of those theaters and make it a, an open symposium and let's see if they ignore the news then but anyhow Francina, I think you want to talk, and then there's Henry. Can we get it quickly, guys? Okay, thank you very much, Hassan, and greetings to everyone. Um, my input is based on the local um uh, radio stations. Um, I just want to give an input regarding how our politicians uh control our local radio stations. We have lost two radio stations in Lepalala the Lepalale FM and also at the Waterbeck FM. Uh, and uh, with the, with that is because they produce every information that is happening in our community, the way our councillors are not doing the work, everything, and that becomes a threat. I agree that uh, the community should be united in making sure that our local radio station are there and um, they are standalone, but that one, it needs strong communities to do that uh, regarding uh, paying of the venues, the rent and all, uh, it must be monitored uh, firmly by communities and making sure that the news that are there are accurate and they are all about uh, their community. Um, that was just my input regarding that. Thank you, my leaders. Yes, uh, Francina Nkosi. Listen, comrades, I think Francina's point, uh, I know, Martin, you you are multi-skilling there. Uh, uh, I think that that point is something that we need to discuss because they're also, they may not have that that reach, but they don't want them to be against them. So these guys will pay these things and make sure that these community radio stations become his master's voice. So clearly, it is an issue that I think we should discuss and, and see how we can sharpen up the discussion before before the elections. Comrade Henry. Over to you, Thank Henry. You very, thank you, um, Hassan. Thank you very much, comrades. Uh, always a pleasure to be on such a platform where um, freedom of speech and um, most importantly, a great input can be considered. I am Henry uh, from the um, queer refugees uh, community in South Africa. and. Um, of course, I will agree on many uh, statements as in um, fake news that has been spread around. And we can all see and understand the rise of hatred towards vulnerable communities. However, I think it's about time, as I've said on my um, message, I think it's about time to uh, come up uh, with tighter regulations that will help hold accountable especially um, community medias in knowing and understanding yeah. and dis uh, disseminating uh, what fake news is and also help um, effective um, reporting or else we are going to be always having to have meetings that most definitely will have inputs, however, oh. will not be as effective as we would like it to be. We are actually um, on the verge of having a human, a human right uh, crisis in the one most um, great country such as South Africa, known as a beacon of uh, human right and human dignity in Africa. So um, that's uh, literally the input that I would like to bring on board, and uh, this by emphasizing that uh, it there is a need for strong regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you, comrades. Uh, could I just, in a, by way of, of uh, rounding off, say that there are a number of concrete things that we, we commit ourselves to do. The consideration of what to do with SABC is not really a big choice. It's just how we how SOS chooses to lead on the process. But I think they have been a, a good partner in 
People's Media Consortium. So that's the one, the SABC and this new bills, big issue, right? We need to get to some some programmatic agreements. Secondly, around community radio stations, I think People's Media Consortium will have to rethink it, especially in in the light of Francina's talk about politicians, local politicians taking over these stations. We need to revisit this with the participation of the Waterberg constituencies and, and comrades there. Then I think, uh, uh, Comrade uh, Sharon, the issues about a complaint to the media. I mean, I don't know from this from this article, there's some content missing because the reference was to IOL themselves, which have been covering uh, um, bogus stories. Uh, of course, with this baby being born, so I mean, no one has seen that baby, but anyhow, leave that story out. The truth be told, every time I've challenged IOL internally, they offer me a right, uh, an article. Now, it's not the ideal one. They offer you a right, right of reply. They take big space, et cetera, et cetera. I think we need to start doing that systematically because I think as elections come, there'll be more attacks on, on foreign-born Africans. And then I, I think alongside that, uh, I didn't plan to say this, uh, Asha, but this issue of Waka, the recommendations actually include uh, uh, xenophobia and related intolerances. And I keep asking, where is the Human Rights Commission? But I should not criticize them at this delicate moment for me. Final uh, final point, I think that what uh, Henry raising, we need to build in the communities there that are willing to fight in their own cause. And I, I think we've got a lot to do. Any last comments from our speakers? Any of the panelists, please, the last two. And maybe Mark. Are you handing over to us or to Mark? No, Tons, and I also wanted to be courteous to Mark. Yeah. So we start with you, um, okay. Uyana. Um, so I think just um, on my side, um, I think uh, as SOS, we're really, really um, keen to obviously have a conversation and see what would, you know, um, what this would materialize into. And just to also say that we do have um, a vision document that kind of stipulates where we want to see the SOS. I mean, we want to see the SAPC going. Maybe that would then be a starting point and a document that we table and present in our first meeting, just so that we are able to then, you know, see where we are and what our understanding and our vision for the SAPC is. And then we'll be able to take it from there and, you know, just, um, you know, forge a way forward. Um, and I'll, I'll set that up um, and I'll, I think we'll just take that conversation offline. Um, with either you or Mark, um, but also just, um, you know, closing comments on my side. I mean, a lot has been said and, you know, it's really, really important. But I think the one thing that's really important as we head to elections, particularly in relation to the public broadcaster, is the issue of editorial interference. So apart from the sustainability issues, but the editorial um, independence that needs to be protected, you know, of the SABC, and we've seen how the board, you know, itself through, you know, um, you know, uh, Mpose who was, you know, um, overseeing a committee, how there was, you know, uh, interferences within the SAPC. So, I mean, there's also, I think, um, a need to look into internal structures at the SAPC and see exactly how those eventually lead to, you know, the, 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 how those actually affect the quality of news that, the people of South Africa get to see. And yeah, and I think maybe if there's other organizations here that are willing to, you know, um, collaborate, um, I think I'm happy for you guys to share my contact details um, and we can have a conversation. But I think over and above, there's a need to ensure that especially public and community media really, really are capacitated and protected and safe safeguarded to ensure that in the upcoming elections, they really, really play, you know, their critical role. Esli? So to add, I'd, I'd um, add that along with the advocacy efforts is building sort of the the capability internally to produce their own content, to scale it up now more than ever, as imperfect as the, these platforms are, um, and as costly as many things are, and as steep appeal as a battle it is, um, I think it's a, a beautiful challenge that uh, there are the, still those opportunities remain, 
and something particularly um, empowering about people taking ownership of these editorial productions and being inside of that um, in practice. It also is a sort of innate digital literacy because once you understand better the practice of how does media get produced, you start to be able to read it differently. So, um, yeah, that's just all that I wanted to add that we continue to support initiatives like the People's Media Consortium and the various spaces that have been opened up through movements and activists to actually um, produce uh, their own content. Thank you very much, uh, Esli. It was part of the comments. Brilliant. Mark, do you want to say anything uh, as we thank you and the other organizers for this event? It's the kind of things we have to do as People's Media Consortium. You know, we sure. commemorate these days and give a different voice. Mark, over to you. Yeah, I wanted to start by thanking you, Hassan, and the, the panelists for a really rich uh, and stimulating discussion. I think the picture that gets painted overall is a, a really dire one. Uh, the classical theory that says the media can inform citizens and can give voice to citizens in a democracy, the kind of fourth estate is clearly in a massive structural crisis. And if we look at the weakness of South Africa's democracy, the rise of authoritarian populist uh, forces from the xenophobes, the ethno-nationalists, uh, the securocrats, uh, we we really see that our democracy is in crisis. And I think the, the central question that gets raised is what we call the media, we're often referring to the dominant media, the media that control the means of distribution. Are they, to what extent are they complicit in the crisis? And I think that that's the really uncomfortable question we need to uh, put on our agenda is, how do we tackle the dominant media so that we get a media that's fit for purpose and can serve the majority of South Africans um, and, and strengthen the democracy? So I think the road is long, but we're in the struggle together. So thanks, everyone. Uh, and over to you, Hassan. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Mark and the other organizers, Martin. Uh, everybody. Comrades, uh, we've made it within two hours. I wanted to be European and be one and a half hours, but anyhow, Mark insisted we, we take long, we take two hours. So within two hours, we finished. Mark, I want to add an additional task. Uh, because we don't have voice, we have to use this particular recording, edit out the oohs and ahs, and we must make a podcast. We, I know, because that's what I do. I'll share it on the Benchmarks website. I'll share it on Facebook. So clearly, I think that's how that's the way we work. When we denied voice, we have to work extra hard to make sure the voice is heard. So I really think that the quality was so high that I, I really think a podcast would be valuable here. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Our numbers have been declining, but the content was incredibly rich. Thank you, and bye-bye.